Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we cannot understand the gift that you gave to each one of us in the gift of Jesus, our Lord, and in the gift of his mother as our mother. So we ask you, Father, to send the Holy Spirit with your gifts of wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we may have a greater truth, a greater knowledge, a greater love of her who is the daughter of the Father, the mother of the Son, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and our own mother Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, patron of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My friends in Jesus and Mary, I think if we take a realistic examination of the headlines of today, and not a pessimistic examination, but a realistic examination, we have to ask the rhetorical question, what do we find? What are the principal headlines in the media, not just in the West, but throughout the world? Well, first of all, unfortunately, there is ubiquitous moral degeneration. We have family breakdown. We have abortion in unprecedented numbers. We have evils unknown to previous times in any degree like it is now, human trafficking. We have attacks on faith. We have attacks on the church. We have attacks on priesthood. We have attacks on the Eucharist. The moral scene is extremely challenging. If we then go and see the other category of headlines, we see natural disasters. And it's interesting to note that in 2010, there were more deaths through natural disaster than through the last 40 years of terrorism. Already just in the United States, in the first five months of 2011, there have been over there, there have been five over one billion dollar natural disasters, and that's before what happened in Joplin, Missouri. And this, of course, is not unique to the United States. Uh, quite the contrary, they're happening so quickly that we're losing a, a typical. Uh, gasp and awe about how many are taking place. We forgot that we lost 600 brothers and sisters in Brazil earlier this year. We've already forgotten about the floods in Australia and New Zealand. The Japanese disaster is something we still have not yet seen the full tragedy of. And even international organizations that document these things are saying, we are simply in an unprecedented level of natural disaster. And let me make one little clarification. Oftentimes, the press will talk about this as Mother Nature being upset or, or Mother Nature showing her ill will. Let me just make a, a, a brief theological, philosophical, scientific clarification. There's no such thing as Mother Nature. Mother Nature doesn't exist. God is the author and the ruler of nature. And as it was in the Old Testament, and as it is in the book of Revelation, God speaks to his people through nature. I remember Mother Angelica uh, on one live show we did uh, years back. She said, I think that creation is rebelling against the level of abortion that's happening in the West. I think creation is, is calling forth some form of justice. And there's a deep theology of creation behind that. But we know that it's sin that generates war. It's sin that generates natural disaster. And keep in mind, my friends, that this is not a hopeless situation. 
but it's a realistic evaluation to realize that God wakes up his children through nature. And quite frankly, God loves us too much to let us rest in a type of hedonistic or pleasurable leisure that could lead us to eternal damnation. He will rather shake us up to return us to kneeling to him instead of to the Dow Jones as the source of our hope. So God is the loving father that will allow or permit or even ordain certain events of natural disaster to get our attention. We know that in the three months after the 9-11 event, not far from here, church attendance rose 40% for the next six months, and then down to 20%, and then a year after 9-11, it was precisely as it was before it happened. So we shouldn't be surprised that God uses nature to get our attention, like a good father will occasionally spank his child for the sake of an improvement, for the sake of an awakening. So natural disasters are clearly a part of our headlines. What else is in present 21st century 2011 headlines? Well, we have wars and rumors of war. We have terrorism on each and every continent. We have unprecedented economic instability, not just in the West, but also in Japan, uh, in Asian markets. Throughout the world, there is, of course, also the battles taking place with the European Union and trying to salvage countries uh, that are going bankrupt. Uh, many economists have said on the world scene, there's never been a worst scenario across the world, even beyond the Great Depression, which was principally in the West than what's happening right now. What else do we have in our headlines? We have unprecedented climate changes. And whether one is in favor or against images of, goal, of global warming, that's not the issue I'm bringing forward. I'm saying that the cycle of weather, and again, this is documented by international weather channels, is never, has never been more unusual, more out of cycle, than in the last two to three years. And then, of course, we have unprecedented change in the Middle East, where you have countries and authorities and dictatorships that have lasted for centuries, and now they seem to be toppled by the month. Now, why do I give you a headline news summation? Because everything I've mentioned was predicted over 50 years ago. And it was predicted by a woman who received the information from another woman, the mother of God, the lady of all nations. I'm making reference to specific geopolitical, economic, and spiritual predictions made over 50 years ago in what is now the church-approved apparitions of the Lady of All Nations. On May 31st, 2002, Bishop Joseph Mariano Spunt declared the apparitions of the Lady of All Nations to be of a supernatural origin. And this is always the first area of examination and of church approval, as the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the Vatican Commission, tells us. It always must first begin with the local bishop. The local bishop has declared the apparitions we're discussing today of supernatural origin. So fascinating, so uncanny are the fulfillments of the prophecies given over 50 years ago that presently there is a Georgetown professor, not of theology, not of philosophy, but of national security, who has written a book on the geopolitical economic prophecies of the Lady of All Nations and their fulfillment. And he maintains that this Dutch woman in the 1950s had more of an awareness of world events and political events and uh, warring events than the CIA, of which he was a participant, and the Russian KGB put together. So where did this woman get this information? 
And what we're going to find in these messages, and today I'm going to give you a summation of these messages, and today I want you to hear it from the mother herself, not just a summation. She will repeatedly say in these messages, my signs are inherent in my words. My signs are inherent in my words. Meaning what? Meaning don't come to Amsterdam and expect to have healings like you have at Lourdes, thank God that you have them in Lourdes, or that solar miracles like you have in Fatima. When you, when you visit, either physically or spiritually, Amsterdam, my signs are inherent in my words. I'm going to tell you things that by their very nature bespeak a supernaturality. They cannot have come from any other source. And that's the conclusion of a Georgetown professor of national security. In 1945, for example, the Blessed Mother told Ida Perdaman, the visionary, that the state of Israel would unite again. And three years later, in 1948, Israel became its own state. In 1946, Our Lady told Ida that there would be a red flag flying over China and a bloody revolt. In 1949, you have Mao Zedong and the communist takeover of China. In 1949, Our Lady showed Ida Korea and said there will be great warring here. She saw a line dividing Korea. And she said it would be an omen for future worries coming from Korea. In 1950, you have the Korean War. You have the split of North Korea and South Korea. And to this day, we do have severe worries about nuclear capacities from North Korea. In the early 1950s, she predicted wars and the, of the most bloody wars in the area of the Balkans. What do we have in the 1990s? Kosovo, the Bosnian Wars, of the most bloody in a bloody history, in a bloody region. And the prophecies go on and on and on. She predicted a man would walk on the moon. She had a prophecy of the Second Vatican Council, seven years before it was in anyone's mind. Ida, who at one point doubted the authenticity of her own apparitions, was given the date of the death of Pius XII in January, that the Pope would, be, that would, would die in October, when up to days before his death, he was still having papal audiences. No one knew that Pius XII would be taken. And this was a sign of Our Lady to encourage Ida, this is of God, this is not of your own making. And perhaps one of the most relevant prophecies uh, for our own time. In 1947, the Blessed Mother said to Ida, showed Ida an image of Cairo. And the visionary Ida said, I felt a great uneasiness when I saw Cairo. And then later in the same message, she saw symbolically stars and stripes colliding with hammers and sickles colliding with crescent moons, bespeaking a place of great political battle. What's happening right now? In fact, Dr. Russell, who is that Georgetown professor, said uh, he's been studying the Middle East for over 20 years. And the one prophecy he didn't understand was the Cairo prophecy. He said, because relatively, Cairo has been somewhat peaceful in light of a lot of turmoil in the Middle East. He said, I didn't understand Cairo until February 2011. And that's why I would ask you to consider these apparitions with a special diligence because the things she prophesied 50 years ago are happening now, right now, in a way that, again, no human governmental intelligent agency could even compare with. Now, I want to try to summarize the message of the Lady of All Nations and why it's such an imperative. Because all these geopolitical prophecies which she made and which are coming true was not for the sake of curiosity. It's not some esoteric trick. It's precisely, as she says in the messages, to get us to listen to the remedy for world peace. In other words, she's saying, I will tell you things 
that only I could tell you, so your shirt's from me, and therefore, God willing, you'll also accept the remedies for world peace, which I'm giving. And it'd be a sad thing if we only were fascinated by these uncanny geopolitical prophecies, but then we didn't do what she said. Because that's the purpose. That's like going to see the miracles of Jesus in, 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 in John 6, and then just wanting to see more miracles. But, but as soon as he talks about the Eucharist, we back off. The purpose of the miracle, the purpose of the prophecy, is to fulfill and to accept the fruit, which in this case is three specific things Our Lady's asking for. So let me read to you. I want to read from four key messages. I cannot you know, strongly enough encourage you to read all the messages of the Lady of All Nations in light of what they're talking about, what it means for us right now. But for the sake of brevity, I want to go through four critical messages, uh, excerpts from four critical messages. And I want to start with the February 11th, 1951 message. Now, once again, these are apparitions that take place in Amsterdam from 1945 to 1959. There's a great series of prophecies, of statements, uh, about future events, about uh, even political elements, about everything from the royal family in England to the challenges Germany would face. Uh, but let's lock in on the spiritual dimension because all those, all the political prophecies are for this, which is the spiritual answer. On February 11th, 1951, our Blessed Mother reveals to the world, of course, the anniversary of Lourdes, right? February 11th, reveals to the world a prayer. And she will say, whoever or whatever you are, pray this prayer. I quote from the message. Quote, I see a bright light, and then I see the lady standing there. That's, of course, Ida's words. She says, quote, I am the lady, Mary, mother of all nations. You may say, the lady of all nations or mother of all peoples, who once was Mary. I have come precisely today in order to tell you that I wish to be known as this. Let all the children of men of all the countries in the world be one. Then the lady says to me, quote, let all men return to the cross. Only this can bring peace and tranquility. I am still standing in front of the cross with the lady. She says to me, quote, repeat this after me. Do say this prayer in front of the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, who once was Mary, be our advocate. Amen. I am still standing in front of the cross and have said the prayer and repeated the Lady's words phrase by phrase. Now I see them written in large characters. The Lady continues, quote, My child, this prayer is so short and simple that each one can say it in his own tongue before his own crucifix. And those who have no crucifix repeat it to themselves. This is the message which I have come to give you today. For I have now come to tell you that I want to save souls. Let all men cooperate in this great work for the world. All right, a comment on the prayer. Notice the beauty, the transparency. Uh, the whole purpose of Our Lady is always to bring us to the Divine Son. This prayer is a prayer to Jesus. And the prayer to Jesus asks what? We ask Jesus to send the Holy Spirit into the hearts of all nations and peoples. So it's a, it's a prayer for a new Pentecost, a new release of the Holy Spirit. And does it make it perfect sense that if you're going to have a new Pentecost, you've got to follow the format of the first Pentecost. And what was that format? That format was Mary in the upper room calling down the Holy Spirit, her divine spouse. And just as spouses can hear the voice of the other spouse across the room in, in, a, in a loud, crowded room, you, you have a special tuning to the voice of your spouse, 
So the Holy Spirit hears his spouse like no one else. And that's the new Pentecost. It's interesting, when Pope Benedict XVI was in New York, he asked the church in America to pray for a new Pentecost, a new descent of the Holy Spirit. And what's the purpose? That the Holy Spirit will prevent the headlines of today, degeneration, disaster, and war. Do you see how timely this is? It's as if Our Lady said these things 50 years ago so that we would both recognize it now and that we would implement the remedy now, which we're going to get to. And this is step one of the remedy, to pray the prayer. Now let me make a very brief explanatory note. The Lady of All Nations who once was Mary be our advocate. Now that prayer, in its original form, has received over 60 imprimaturs throughout the world, from cardinals and bishops in, in places throughout the world. Okay. It's interesting that when the prayer was given and Edith reported it to her bishop, there was someone in the diocese that said, who once was Mary? Take that out. That's confusing at, at best. Take it out. Uh, a couple months later, our Blessed Mother came back and said, put it back in because it relays a truth. And let me say uh, just a brief word of explanation. The Lady of All Nations who once was Mary, what does that mean? Use this analogy, my friends. Pope Benedict XVI, who once was Joseph. Now, is he still Joseph? Well, he certainly is. I wouldn't recommend calling him Joseph if you get a papal audience. Not because he's not Joseph, but he has a new role. And with his new role as Pope, he has a new title. And that's precisely what happens with Our Lady. Mary of Nazareth says yes to God's will, not just to the angel, but all the way up to Calvary, up to the crucifixion. And there at the cross in John 19, 25 through 27, she gets a new role. She becomes the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate of all humanity. She becomes the spiritual mother of all humanity. And those are the words, those are the final gift that Jesus gives to humanity before he dies. Behold your mother. And so it's appropriate that the woman who has a new title, who has a new role, would now receive a new title. So the lady of all nations who once was Mary, it's, to, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, making reference to, it's indicating, it's articulating the fact that Mary cooperated all the way through her life. She wasn't just co-redemptrix, mediatrix, an advocate in its fullness as Mary of Nazareth. She had to continue to suffer with Jesus and for Jesus as the co-redemptrix to get that title. Now, and so the, the, who once was Mary was put back in until 2006. In 2006, there was an official uh, at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, at the Vatican Congregation, who has the proper supervision of, of elements of faith and morals, who thought that the phrase might be confusing pastorally. Now, uh, this, this official is no longer in the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. He's, he's uh, moved on. But out of obedience to the preference of that official, the Bishop of Amsterdam uh, replaced that expression, who once was Mary, with the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's not inferring there's anything theologically wrong. Uh, our Blessed Mother's pretty sharp theologically between you and me. She doesn't make theological errors. But she also appreciates obedience. And so in obedience, the Bishop of Amsterdam put in that clause, at least as a temporary uh, pastoral response to the request. But look at the purpose of the prayer. Our Blessed Mother is saying everyone, everyone throughout the world in their own tongue is called to pray that prayer before the cross. And this is remedy number one, to pray the prayer. Because she will reveal to us that this is the ultimate prayer for remedy number three, which is the proclamation of the dogma. Let's go on. April 29th, 1951, the Blessed Mother gives an explanation of the dogma. And realize what's happening in history. Okay, in 1950, you have the dogma of the Assumption. And that completes the four dogmas. And we'll talk about this in the next address as well. That also completes 
a solemn declaration of all of Mary's earthly prerogatives, right? Mother of God, immaculate conception, perpetual virgin, and then she's assumed. But it doesn't talk about a relationship between you and me or her and all the world. Those four dogmas are true and solemn, but in one sense, they prepare us for this fifth truth, that is, that Mary is mother to you and to me. And that's why, historically, she says in these messages, this request for a fifth dogma had to come after the assumption was defined. So Our Lady is perfectly logical in her theology as well. So I want to read an excerpt from an April 29, 1950 one message. She says, and I quote, I stand here as the co-redemptrix and advocate. Everything should be concentrated on that. Repeat this after me. The new dogma will be the dogma of the co-redemptrix. Notice I lay special emphasis on co. I have said that it will arouse much controversy. Once again, I tell you that the church, Rome, will see it through and silence all objections. The church, Rome, will incur opposition and overcome it. The church, Rome, will become stronger and mightier in proportion to the resistance she puts up in the struggle. My purpose and my commission to you is none other than to urge the church, the theologians, to wage this battle. For the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit wills to send the Lady chosen to be the Redeemer, to be, excuse me, chosen to bear the Redeemer into this world as co-redemptrix and advocate. I have said, this time is our time. By this, I mean the following. The world is caught up in degeneration and superficiality. It is at a loss. Therefore, the Father sends me to be the advocate to implore the Holy Spirit to come. For the world is not saved by force. The world will be saved by the Spirit. Okay, two important notes here. First of all, she lays special emphasis on co. What does co mean? Co comes from the Latin prefix cum, which means with. It does not mean equal. That would be blasphemy. It would be heresy. And nothing would wound the Immaculate Heart more than had to have anyone put Mary on a level of equality with Jesus. But she is the co-redemptrix. That means she's the woman with the Redeemer. She's the woman that suffers with Jesus and under Jesus in the restoration of grace. And you know what, my friends? They understood this in the second and third centuries. Why don't we understand it today? In the second and third centuries, they called Mary the new Eve. That just as the first Eve participated with Adam in losing grace for humanity. So God wanted a second Eve. He wanted a second woman to cooperate with Jesus, the new Adam, as St. Paul calls him, to restore grace. So who could dare say, well, you know, actually, as I examine myself, I think I did more than any other person on earth to help Jesus save the world. Who would dare say that? Who would dare say it in this room? Who would dare say it in this time? Who would dare say it every century from this century back to the first century? Who would dare say, well, I did more than Mary. I did more than say yes. I did more than give my Redeemer his body for redemption. I suffered more with Jesus than Mary did. I was there at Calvary watching my son brutalized and, and horribly outraged. And I was offering it for the salvation of all, who would dare say that? And yet, that's the simple meaning of this title. It's not complex. Co-redemptrix means Mary uniquely worked with Jesus in saving the world. It's, it's not difficult. It's a clear scriptural and traditional truth. And so she emphasizes this. Now she makes a very important point. She says again, the church Rome will incur opposition and overcome it. The church Rome will become stronger and mightier in proportion to the resistance she put up in the struggle. Let me give you one historical example. In the middle of the 19th century, Pius 
the Ninth, blessed Pius the Ninth, was run out of Rome, run out of the Vatican by a group of Masons uh, that were uh, taking over that region. It was a great political move at the time. So he's in exile. Okay. While he's in exile, two cardinals come up and say, Holy Father, we think the only hope for restoring the papacy in the church right now is that you will declare the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Because then you're going to bring Our Lady into this church situation and she's going to flood it with grace. Well, thank God, Blessed Pius IX listened. And it's a historical fact that it was while he was in exile from the Vatican that he wrote to every bishop in the world saying, I am going to proclaim the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And what those cardinals told him came to pass. The Pope and the Church regained such a strength. In fact, it was rumored in Rome before the definition that the Church was going to disappear and the papacy and the papal states were going to disappear entirely. It was, well, the church is like the Roman Empire. It's, it, its time is gone. Until the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And there was a new championing of the church. Think about that right now, my friends. One of the major objections to a dogma, to having our present Holy Father, Pope Benedict, declare a dogma is, you know what, the church isn't enough of a mess. We don't need more controversy. We've got scandals. We've got difficulties. We've got laxity. Let's not rock the boat. I think both heaven and history say it's the opposite. This is when we need the mother. This is when we need her powerful intercession, right now when things are difficult. Because she says in these messages, as history bears, the church will get stronger in proportion to fighting for this dogma. And I think that's why we have to cover Pope Benedict XVI in our heartfelt prayers that he will also see heaven's remedy to the crises in the church. And there's been no pope that's been more attacked since Pius IX as Pope Benedict has been attacked at our time. I think it's a, it's a profound parallel. She says, again, a call to the Holy Spirit that this dogma will bring forth the Holy Spirit. Now, how does that work? Because when the Pope proclaims the dogma and recognizes Our Lady, then and only then is Our Lady free to exercise her full intercession. Grace cannot be forced upon us, my friends. That's one of the, the guidelines of the Heavenly Father. Just like Jesus couldn't have been forced upon Mary. So you, you see the irony of our time that God awaited the yes of a virgin to bring us Jesus. Now that virgin is awaiting our yes. We've got to say yes to her. And when the vicar of Christ, not if, but when the vicar of Christ says yes to her, then the Holy Spirit will come in this new Pentecost. I want to read the last part of this message. Our Lady says, quote, In the sufferings both spiritual and bodily, the Lady, the Mother, has shared. She has always gone before. As soon as the Father had elected her, she was the co-redemptrix with the Redeemer who came into the world as the man-god. Tell that to your theologians. I know well the struggle will be hard and bitter. And then the lady smiles to herself and seems to gaze into the far distance, but the outcome is already assured. That, my friends, is heaven's promise that it's not if the dogma happens, it's when the dogma happens. But I can also tell you it'll happen sooner if we give her our yes, if we enter and accept these remedies. Third message. This is a message specifically to the theologians. Uh, this is April 4th, 1954. Why would I focus a message to the theologians? Because quite frankly, and, and with all due respect, no one has blocked the progress of this dogma more than the theological community. I'm sorry to say. Uh, what the faithful have in their hearts and live daily that, our, our, that Mary is the mother who suffers for us. She's the mother that nourishes us. She's the mediatrix. She's the mother who pleads on our behalf. What the faithful live daily, sometimes, sometimes, there's a block in the minds of theologians uh, that the faithful don't have. And so they quickly give fiat to these truths because they experience the mother this way daily. Whereas sometimes the intellectual element can block elements of the heart. 
I want to read just a short segment from this April 4th, 1954 message. And I quote, this is Eda again, I see the lady standing with a serious look on her face. She says to me, once more I am here, listen well. From the outset, the handmaid of the Lord was chosen to be co-redemptrix. Tell your theologians that they can find it in all their books. The lady pauses briefly, then smiles to herself. She says, almost in a whisper, I am not bringing a new doctrine. I am now bringing old ideas. What does that mean? That means in the 1950s, any book on Mariology, any book, any manual on the truth about Our Lady had very clearly Our Lady's role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces and advocate. In every language, there's, there's, there's six major Mariological publications in six different languages. All of them are covered, especially during this time, with treatment about Mary's co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. So here's the Blessed Mother saying to theologians, where's the problem? This is already in your writings. And she whispers, this is an old idea. Yeah, it's 2,000 years old. That's how old this is. This is not a new doctrine. This is already what, we, what the church teaches. She continues, because the lady is co-redemptrix, she is also mediatrix and advocate. Not only because she is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, but, and mark this well, because she is the Immaculate Conception. Now, I'm going to show some uh, temperance in not getting into this. This could be a course, a subcourse in Mariology, this line right here. What is she saying in, in some? She said, because she's the mother who suffered with Jesus to obtain the grace, it's appropriate that she would be the mother who distributes the grace. So because she's co-redemptrix, she's mediatrix and advocate. Some people have said, look, you know, you get this dogma passed a lot quicker if you just drop that co-redemptrix title. That's, that's just too controversial. Uh, you know what that would be like, my friends? That's like saying, you know, you'd get more people to accept the mass if you drop that sacrifice stuff. Just have people go to communion. Just have the sacred meal. Uh, but we know as informed Catholics, if you drop the sacrifice, there is no sacred meal. If you drop the co-redemptrix, there's no mediatrix and advocate. So it's another well-intended, I'm sure, effort to say, let's, let's, let's push the cross away and let's benefit from the graces and the blessings. But it doesn't work that way. It's got to be put together. She says, one last quote for the theologians. Theologians, I ask you, do you still have objections to this dogma? You can find these words and idea. I ask you to work for this dogma. No, fear nothing. There will be a clash. The other will indeed attack you. But the simplicity of this dogma lies in these last thoughts which Mary, the Lady of all nations, puts before you today. Do fight and ask for this dogma. It is the crowning of your lady. So here you have Our Lady almost saying, remember, I'm your mother, theologians. Defend me. Have a certain courage in articulating me. And it seems like, and again, I'm not speaking about the entire theological community, but I can attest that there are many who are afraid. They feel like somehow it might be anti-ecumenical. It'll hurt Christian unity. Let me make one thing very easy. Mothers unite children like no one else can unite children. The more you focus on the mother, the more you're going to have Christian unity. The more you put the mother on the side and think we're going to get unity ourselves, the longer we are prolonging Christian unity. The mother unites, and that's what heaven wants. Fourth and last message. This is arguably the single most important message of these apparitions. This is May 31st, 1954. She says, quote, Once more I am here. The co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate is now standing before you. I have chosen this day. On this day, the lady will be crowned. Now, just an explanatory note, this is May 31st of 54. At that time, May 31st was the feast of the Mediatrix of All Graces. Theologians and apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, listen carefully. I have given you the explanation of the dogma. Work and ask for this dogma. You should petition the Holy Father for this dogma. The Lord Jesus Christ has wrought great things and will give even more to you all in these times. On this date, the Lady of all nations will receive her official title. Note well these three concepts in one. 
these three. At this point, the lady puts up three fingers and moves the other hand round about her until she becomes, as it were, enveloped in a delicate mist. Now I have demonstrated these three concepts to your theologians, these three concepts as one whole. I am saying this twice because there are some who will accept only one concept. The Holy Father will agree to the former, but you have to help him to achieve this. Make no mistake. Uh, what does all that mean? It's a brief note here. First of all, she, she, she puts three fingers up and she encircles the other hand around it and then a mist uh, comes forward. And she says, I'm illustrating somebody to the theologians. What is she showing? She's showing that these are not three separate dogmas or truths. It's one mother who performs three tasks. One spiritual mother who suffers for us, who nourishes us in this supernatural life, and who pleads for us. And this should not be so confusing for us, right? How many mothers did we have? God willing, we had a mother who suffered for us, uh, sometime soon after conception with morning sickness, certainly in delivery, and uh, I find with eight children, the older they get, the more suffering increases. Okay. So there's suffering, there's nourishing, and there's pleading. One mother, three functions. One truth, not three dogmas. One dogma with three aspects. And then Our Lady says, the Holy Father will agree to the former. What does that mean? That's what we talked about with co-redemptrix. Many people saying, oh, leave the co-redemptrix off, we'll go with mediatrix and advocate. No, the Holy Father will define co-redemptrix. How do we help him? We help him two ways, prayers and petitions. And we'll talk about this in a moment. She goes on. And all of a sudden, it is as if I was standing with the lady over the dome of a big church. And as we enter, I hear the lady say, quote, I am taking you inside this. Tell others what I let you see and hear. We are now in a very big church in St. Peter's. I see lots of cardinals and bishops. The Pope enters. He is being carried in a kind of chair. People applaud. The choir begins to sing. Now the Holy Father is announcing something while holding up two fingers. Then all at once, the lady is standing on the globe again and says with a smile, In this way, my child, I have let you see what is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. This day will, in due time, become the coronation day of his mother, the Lady of all nations, who once was Mary. So, we think we're cutting edge with PowerPoint and 21st century techniques and everything else. Here the Blessed Mother said, I've explained it. I've explained it several times. Now let me show it to you. And Our Lady gives Ida a vision of the proclamation of the dogma in St. Peter's, with the Pope holding up two fingers, a sign of his authority, surrounded by the cardinals, and saying, this will in due time become the coronation day. So this is how clear the mother is, is being. No one can misinterpret what heaven is asking for in these messages. Number one, praying the prayer of the Lady of all nations. Number two, praying and petitioning for this fifth dogma assisting the Holy Father. And, and what does that mean? How do you assist the Holy Father? Certainly we know the prayer part, right? Assisting the Holy Father by petitions means that the Holy Father can say, this is not just my idea. I didn't just come up with this in a dream. The people want this too. My faithful, the sensus fidelium, the common sense of the faithful, they also want this. So I am, you know, the servus servorum dei. I'm serving the people with this as well, apart from the fact that he must have it in his own heart. And that's the value of the petitions. One last closing part of the message. The lady waits a while and says in a low voice, My prophecy, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, will be fulfilled more than ever once the dogma has been proclaimed. The Holy Father knows his time. He will prepare it. From now on, all nations will call me blessed. The lady of all nations desires unity in the Holy Spirit of truth. The world is encompassed by a false spirit, Satan. When the dogma, the last dogma in Marian history has been proclaimed, the Lady of all nations will give peace, true peace to the world. The nations, however, must say my prayer in union with the church. They must know that the Lady of all nations has come as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. So be it. So what does Our Lady say in this last message? First of all, this dogma is going to fulfill Scripture. 
It's the ultimate fulfillment of the scriptural call that all generations will call me blessed. Why? Because it's going to be the vicar of Christ, the highest authority on earth, acknowledging solemnly that she is our spiritual mother in these three capacities. Secondly, and let's be absolutely clear about this, the dogma is a condition for world peace. No dogma, no world peace. And we know the dogma will happen. The question is, when? When? I envision Our Lady with this dogma as being a good mother 10 months pregnant. She wants to give birth to this dogma because only then can she fully exercise her roles of intercession to help bring peace to the world. And that's why the Amsterdam message is a continuation of the Fatima message. Remember the promise of Fatima. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph and a period of peace will be granted to the world. Now Our Lady is saying as well, she must be solemnly recognized to intercede for peace. So in sum, number one, we pray the prayer, the prayer of the Lady of all nations. We can get this, you can download it. Uh, we have uh, someone sending out copies. If, if you want to get copies of the prayer of the Lady of all nations, you don't have them, uh, you can contact us at mary at motherofallpeoples.com. Mary, mother of, Mary at motherofallpeoples.com and email. If you need 10, 100, 1,000 prayer cards, we'll send them. Uh, Our Lady will provide the monies. We've got to get this moving and get you uh, being evangelists for this. Number two, you notice Our Lady said that the Holy Father, that the, that the prayer must be prayed in the church. Our Lady also asks that the Holy Father would lead the nations in praying this prayer. So I ask you to keep in your prayers, our Holy Father, that he will indeed pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. And then number three, praying and fasting for the dogma. That means our rosary intentions, our mass intentions, pray and petition the Holy Father. Uh, it's also very uh, easy to send in a petition. We've had only over 7 million petitions that have happened in the last 15 years. The petition movement is almost 100 years old, as we'll talk about in the second talk. But if you have not added your petition, you know what? You want to do it for Our Lady, and you want to do it for your kids and your grandkids. You want to be able to say, yeah, I, I was a little part of making history. I sent my petition in, and I was part of the seven or eight or nine million people who asked the Pope to do this. And you can do that, too, uh, either online. You can go to fifthmariandogma.com or motherofallpeoples.com and send it electronically. Or guess what? You can write the Pope yourself. And if you write to... Pope Benedict XVI, Vatican City, Europe, it'll get to him. Not necessarily to his front desk, but it'll get to the Vatican. And what would you say? Who am I to write to the Pope? What would I say? Write to your father from the heart. Say something that your heart calls you to say, like, I think the time is right. Holy Father, be God's will. My idea is it's, it's the right time. Whatever the Spirit inspires you, but add your petition. We're going to stop now for a break. Let's pray the prayer, though, of the Lady of All Nations. I see some good folks passing out the prayer. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to do a primer on the Fifth Marian Dogma. I'm going to try to talk about some of the major objections to co-redemptrix, mediatrix, advocate. What is a dogma anyway, and why does it have to be proclaimed? But let's, uh, let's pause and let's pray, and then we'll take 10 or 15 minutes and, and then come back. So... As we have the prayer, let's pray it in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's take 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll return back. Thank you.